It's good to be back. I am uh, always excited to talk about technology. Let me see if I can get my technology to work. Here we go. Try this again. Oh, I see what happened. go. That's better. There's always bugs in the system. All right, as uh, Dr. Horton said, uh, my name is Daniel. I was previously a teacher. Uh, I taught everything from uh, K through 10, one room school, multi-teacher school. Um, and that's where I started. That's where my passion is in education. Um, and now I work in IT for the conference. Uh, so my, my passions for education and technology, they started in the classroom and worked their way up to um, doing it as a full-time uh, job. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, I'd like to take you through, uh, I presented on different topics for EdTech over the years, uh, just the software, just Google, um, just little tips and tricks that would help in your classroom. Uh, there's a lot going on these days and I would like to make sure that you get the, the big picture of what's going on in your school, because I get a lot of questions from schools sometimes. What do we do about this? What do we do about this? And some of them are very fundamental questions. So I'm going to start at the beginning. It may be new for some of you, uh, or it may be um, old hat. You may, you may say, oh yeah, no, we're good. We have our technology completely set up. Uh, either way, it's good to review. It's good to rethink. Uh, you know, just check your work, essentially. Maybe your school is completely set up from the ground up. You have the highest technology. It's still good to take a, take a review of it, make sure that you're still in compliance with the best practices, safety, security. And if you're starting from scratch, this will also be a good um, overview, but it's not going to give you all of the in-depth because <laughs> that's uh, impossible in an hour and 20 minutes uh, or even a week. So we're just going to kind of go through it. After this session, as Dr. Horton mentioned, we are, I am going to stay by and it'll be a, a deeper question and answer, uh, maybe a little bit of a workshop where, hey, if you have something that you're trying to get set up for the first time, we might be able to you know, do that a little bit, not exactly one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, everybody can kind of see how to get that started. Um, so, but if you do have questions in the middle of the presentation, feel free to interrupt me. We can we can uh, try to address those as we go. But it may be a ah, let's 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 address that afterward because it's going to take a little bit more time. All right. So at the very beginning, um, you want to do your best every time because by doing a thing well, you build something valuable into yourself. Um, a lot of schools. And, and this, is, this is nothing against our schools, but a lot of our schools have just gotten by on their, on their technology. And I, I see it all the time. I go in and um, it's like, how, how is this working? And why are you having so many, trouble, so many issues? And it's because it was maybe what was OK at the time, or it was whatever they knew how to do but it wasn't the best practices. And that's something that, that happens, that we talk about a lot in, in IT and even in uh, education, best practices for the industry, for your field. And in IT, um, if you are not following best practices, you can still get along, maybe. But oftentimes that gets farther and farther and farther behind as, it, as, as you go through. And so the thing that was it was okay five years ago. It is no longer even uh, brushing the surface. So we're going to talk about infrastructure, building our, our technological house upon the rock. So the first, first things first, very basic foundation, uh, getting connected. Um, you're going to have your, your basic internet. That's the, uh, represented here by the shiny cloud. 
and it's going to go from the internet into what's called a um, modem. And I think you know, even back in the day, you know, we knew the modem is the thing that made all the noise when you needed to connect to the internet. These days, it doesn't make as much noise, uh, but it it does still do the same thing. It's uh, you know, cable modem now instead of dial-up, but it's the thing that connects our building from the internet comes in and it translates that signal. So you may recognize these. You may have one of these in your school or in your home. Um, and generally, they look like this. On the, on the left is a Comcast box. On the right is an AT&T box. And these just take the signal from the internet and connect with your internet service provider, or ISP. And it, um, it gives your basic service. So for our schools, basic, very minimum requirements. You want to have one and a half megabits per second, one and a half to three megabits per second per student or teacher in the building. Um, this is because this is something called bandwidth because the each person is going to take a little bit of that speed or that signal and. If you only have three megabits per second to share among the entire school, that means that out of 10 people, you all have about three tenths of a megabit per second. Um, to give you a um, to give you a reference, 1.5 megabits per second is what's recommended for the very basic functions: checking your email, maybe editing docs that don't have to be collaborative and you have to see every single change, the basic kind of website browsing. Uh, three megabits per second is the lowest standard uh, for streaming video. So if you are streaming something from Netflix, YouTube is a little bit more resilient because it can, it can do really, really, really low quality videos. Um, but if you're doing something from like a streaming service, three megabits per second is actually below HD quality. It's like standard, called standard video, but these days HD is the standard. So uh, five megabits per second is what you need for, stan or for HD. And so this just gives you an idea that this is the bottom of the, of the requirement, and if you go higher, good, that's great. Keep, keep, keep going for what fits your budget. Now, do you need 100 megabits per second per person? No, you're going to blow your budget on just internet service. So this is, this is giving you a good reference point, and if you go a little higher, that's good. You don't have to go crazy, but stay there. Um, so yeah, if you have nine students and one teacher, 15 to 30 megabits per second is what you're looking for. Now the megabits per second, people think it's megabytes per second. The bits are actually one eighth of a megabyte. So this is actually, um, you know, if you're looking, thinking about files, Multiple, uh, divide that by eight, and that's how each megabyte is, but you don't need to know that. Um, more devices at the school will require more bandwidth. So if you fill your school with smart displays, Wi-Fi thermostats, security cameras, and then everybody has a cell phone, uh, guest devices coming in, even smart watches, they take up bandwidth on the Wi-Fi network. So think about the environment that you have at your school or that you want to have at your school and plan for that, buffer that, um, uh, you know, one, to, one and a half to three megabits per second a little bit more if you think that you're going to be adding more and more of these devices that aren't necessarily the student devices or the teacher computer, but it is still something that is going to take up some of that bandwidth. Okay, so you have internet coming into your, um, into your building. Now what? Now you need to have what's called a Wi-Fi router. So you have the modem, which translates the signal and brings it into your building. The router routes the signal to each device that's going to be using it, and it, and it negotiates the, the communication back and forth. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, the higher end routers now, they do something called four by four, which means that they have four channels up and four channels down at any time. That means that four devices, and we think like, wow, there's hundreds of devices, networks working fine. Actually, they are practicing what we try to teach our students, stand in line, wait your turn, be patient, uh, but they do it really, really fast, so you think it's all instantaneous. So four by four means that four devices can be connected simultaneously, speaking out to the internet and also receiving information back from the internet. And that can be separate too. Um, they have other, other standards, but usually if you get a decent one, it's four by four. Um, so 
they come in all different shapes and sizes, all different crazy antenna arrays. They have ones that have multiple um, ones that you put across the school. Um, but they, they're all generally the same. They do this. Now, most schools that I see, they have either the standard uh, modem that comes from your internet service provider, which is um, often, it's also a Wi-Fi access point. So that is a router and a modem together. Um, that's kind of the basic. It's meant more for home. Sometimes they have business ones and those, those cover a little bit wider. They can handle more devices on them at a time. But a lot of times schools have even just the home one. Um, and these ones, if you add this to your, um, to your modem, you might be able to increase your range, increase the number of de devices on at a time. Uh, what I'm trying to do and what we have been suggesting is to standardize out towards um, a system for schools that will be able to handle more devices, more range, more area. And uh, this, is, this is my setup at home with my modem on the right and my router in the middle there. Uh, so I have that down in the basement and it covers my whole house. But this is my dream for my house and for schools. This is a, called a Dream Machine Pro. Uh, and it is essentially a small, affordable version of what large businesses use. It's, it's, got, in, it's got built in it. it. Let's see. Now I'm blanking. I can't remember if it has a modem built in. I don't think so. Maybe. But it is your router. And um, it also can handle multiple access points. So now instead of having to just connect one device into your modem and then that covers your whole area and you hope you get it central enough in your school that it kind of reaches the corner classrooms. Now you can place these little uh, puck looking things and you can run lines across to the different rooms and cover a wider area. So now your school becomes uh, more like a small business setup where there's, there's coverage across the entire building. It has a lot of advanced features. You can set up multiple networks. Um, so you know you see some places they have a staff network, a student network, they have a guest network, they have uh, one just for the smart devices that they have. You can do all of that on here very easily on their, on their um, cloud dashboard interface. And um, in addition to that, if you ever want to set up security cameras, this also is a um, called an NVR, digital video, uh, network video recorder. And you can add security cameras on this. It's built into it. It also has built-in firewall capabilities. So now you have your, your web traffic is being protected. Um, you know, you have to configure it if you want really strict protection, but it's kind of, you give you some basic protection to start out with. So this is kind of an all-in-one. The, the base device here is about $379. And then the access points are anywhere between $80 to $150, depending on if you want little ones or they are, you know, they have the fashionable ones and then they have the, the really long range big ones that could cover like an entire gym. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're building out. Uh, but f more or less, I estimate anywhere between under $1,000 to like top $2,000 to cover an entire school with this network. Um, so it's, it's a really versatile device. Eventually I'm gonna put one in my home. We're looking to buy a house right now, so this will be like one of my first projects to, to stick into our house, cover the whole thing. Uh, but for schools, this is a really great option. We've actually done them for, um, for the warehouse. The conference warehouse uses one of these. So it's not just a, you know, oh, that looks pretty. It actually works really nicely too. Um, so that's your, that's your Dream Machine Pro. You can see, you can do just a simple, this is a simple setup. You have your, it starts with your cable modem going into the Dream Machine Pro. Uh, they use um, a switch, and that's a, called a POE, Power Over Ethernet switch. And what that does is it allows you to power the access points or the cameras or whatever's you know, connected into it without having to put a power adapter on the end. So now you just connect it with an ethernet cable and it gets power as well as signal. 
Um, so the debate, you know, you don't have to have the switch, but it's nice, especially if you want to have more devices, because the um, Dream Machine Pro only has eight ports uh, for devices. So if you need more than that, or if you want to just power them coming straight out of it, then you get a switch too. And still, that's going to get you under the $2,000 for the entire package. Um, and then from the switch or directly from the Dream Machine Pro, you go to an access point. So this is your Wi-Fi access point. When it's in the room, this is what your device is going to connect to. Hopefully it connects to the nearest one. Sometimes it might connect to, it does um, smart uh, switching and routing for the, for the devices. So if it's like, hey, I'm really full in this room, well, there's a room that's right next door and I can still get a pretty good signal from it. There's not as many devices on that. I'm going to go over here and now my connection will be a little faster. When you just have the one like home router device, it's all going through the same one. Often it gets crowded. Students pull up their Chromebooks or something and half of the students are fine and half the students, I can't load, it's not coming on. Just give it a minute, we'll, we'll wait. <laughs> you know? So it, this, this also helps with that because it does some of that traffic negotiating on a higher level than a home router does. Um, so you have your, your uh, access points, and then you can also have computers that are plugged directly into the ports. Um, that's a simple setup. You can also go as, as uh, you know, advanced as having um, a bunch of them, a bunch of the access points over here, a uh, bunch of wired ones. These are your security cameras coming in here. They have some network storage connected up. You're probably not going to worry about that unless you have an IT person at your school. But this is, you know, this right here could probably be done, you know, in a weekend by pretty much anybody. It's very, they've done a very good job of making it step by step, follow this next, you know, wizard in the, in the, you know, instructions. So uh, pretty easy. And then you can get it as uh, advanced as you want. So it's nice because it's flexible. Works for a small school, works for a big school. Next thing we're going to talk about is security. Um, you have this connection to the internet now. So now you need to keep it secure. It's coming into your building. So what do you do with it? Um, filters versus firewalls. Uh, the Dream Machine Pro has the firewall built in. Uh, the firewall is intended to identify and prevent attacks on your network and devices, either active or passive. So let's say you're browsing, you click a link that looks like the right link, but it's the wrong link, and it's trying to take you to this uh, a connection, and now the, your, your network is recognizing that you're going to a malicious uh, connection. It's starting to do things that a normal normal session wouldn't do. A firewall is there to prevent that kind of traffic. Sometimes it'll prevent it from even going out. It will uh, recognize web traffic by based on the country of origin. It'll say, hey, wait a second, uh, why are you trying to connect to something in Peru? This isn't normal traffic. Normally you would just connect to the local internet service. So it, it recognizes some of these things. It recognizes intrusive attacks where the hacker actually somehow finds your IP address and is trying to directly attack your network and get in. Um, so the firewall is kind of like a, 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 a fence, uh, you know, a gate, locked door. It's trying to, to keep out the bad guys. Um, and also keep you from connecting to them. A filter, on the other hand, is intended to prevent inappropriate, malicious, or otherwise unwanted content from being accessed. And these are, these are also passive attacks as well. But it goes beyond that to where uh, it filters, maybe you don't want games on your network. You can filter out that category. Maybe you don't want um, uh, music videos being able to be pulled up from uh, YouTube. A filter can do that. And so the filter is made, is focused more on content and what kinds of things your network can be used for, whereas the firewall is more security and, and behind the scenes um, type of protection. So one type of filter is GoGuardian. Um, it has multiple filtering options, lots of categories. Um, it has smart filters and, and, and alerts that are on it. So you can just pick the categories that you want to block, and it is automatically monitoring websites, not just for, hey, does this match this list that we have, uh, but it also checks the websites as you try to access them and says, hey, you know what, this doesn't look right. And it either blocks it or it alerts the teacher that says, hey, um, you, you might want to check this out. 
uh, it allows screen monitoring of student devices. So you can see what's on each student's screen, what, uh, what tabs they have open. You can uh, actually close their tabs if you want to or open a tab for them if they are you know, needing some guidance. Um, they've actually added within the last year, I think they added the ability to um, go on and point to things on their screen. So you click and it creates a little beacon, a red beacon that pops up and ping, oh, look over here on this part. Um, Scenes, so you can do scenes for classes. Let's say you don't want to have to have everything locked down all the time for specific classes. When you open up the math class or when the schedule flips over to the math class, however you set it up, it'll automatically impose a certain list of uh, websites that are or are not available. So it'll block some and it will specifically pop up some others. Um, and then when you go to the next class for English, well, now this set is available. Uh, it also, they have video conferencing, screen control for uh, remote support for students. That's another feature that they've recently added in. Um, they have a lot of great features. The downside is they're expensive. <laughs> so they used to be about the price of, um, about the price of uh, light, light speed. Now they're the same price as light speed, but they've imposed a minimum of $1,500 per school for you to get started. Yeah, so <clears throat> they are still the best. I have not found anything that compares to how easy they are to use, um, how intelligent the filters are. It, it does image searching even, so if it just recognizes that a picture on a website that otherwise would be good looks like it might be bad, it lets you know. So uh, th I haven't found another, another filter that does that. But the $1,500 price tag is very expensive considering I was used to paying about $150 per year for, for my students, for all my devices. Um, so it's a, it's a big price tag. If it's in your budget and you want really good filtering, I suggest you go with this. It's Otherwise, yeah, it is, it is. And yeah, and if and it, hopefully they'll change their prices again someday. I don't know. It was yeah. I actually bought it for fifteen hundred in April. Yeah. They said that was in May they were going to up the prices again. So I don't know. I think they're up to two now. Oh my goodness. Oh man. Yeah, because it, it's not their prices; it's their minimum. So so even if you have ten students, you have to buy a hundred a hundred licenses, and it just yeah. So that's that's sad that they're going up even higher. Um, I found that out last small schools workshop actually because I was presenting. I was like, yeah, everybody should get it. It's really cheap and it's really good. And then somebody was like, I just talked to them. How did you get it so cheap? I'm like, what do you mean? And then I found that out. I did some research. I talked to their customer service. Like, guys, I've been working with you for years. Why are you <laughs> like, sorry, it's all, oh, okay. So alternatively, I have also been working with Lightspeed Systems. Um, they have filtering categories. Um, they have screen monitoring. They have suicide prevention alerts. Go Guardian also has that as well. Um, Lightspeed, it's called Beacon. So you can set that up. They'll monitor searches and, and website activities so that they, you know, they can identify patterns. Um, they have great customer service. And they are inexpensive. They are on the um, NAD store for technology. Uh, the cons, no smart categories. So the categories are, are, are manually created, essentially. They know a list of uh, websites that are bad and they fall into these different categories of violence. Uh, but they don't automatically pick up new websites. So unless a website has already been found and reported, um, it's not on their list. So unfortunately, that means that your student might be the first one to find one that's not on the list. Um, it's slightly less user friendly and intuitive. Uh, it, it's a little harder to set up on the back end. Um, if you want things specifically locked down in a certain way, you have to go in and manually create the lists and, and do all that. So it, it is a lot more, but it's only, I think, 12, let's see, I can't remember the, I don't remember the pricing, I haven't looked at it this year, but it's around, 12 to $15 per device to get everything, everything covered. So 
that is a much nicer price tag than 15 or two two thousand. Oh, that's that hurts. Um, so yeah, so the, so check those options out. See which one you know works for your school. But I highly recommend that um, filtering our students' devices are it's required. It's one of the things we need to we have to do. But doing it well is important. Um, you know, for a lot of reasons. But mostly, we just want to protect our kids. Um, you know, yes, could they go home and, and get it on their unfiltered devices? Absolutely, but at least when they're in our school, we wanna make sure that what they're getting is, is appropriate to the standards that we set for ourselves. Um, and it also does protect against malicious attacks as well, because a lot of malicious things are hidden in websites, and it again filters stuff like that as well. Um, another thing to protect yourself is setting passwords and multi-factor authentication, or MFA, sometimes called 2FA, like two-factor authentication. Um, passwords should be complex and unique. Don't reuse or pattern your passwords. Uh, patterning is, um, if I say my password is Johnny17 Amazon. Johnny 17 Google, Johnny 17 Apple. That's a pattern. If one of those passwords is compromised, that means that someone goes, hmm, that's interesting. It says Amazon. I wonder what happens when I put something else in, like bank. Um, and then they can easily find your password. So your password is only as strong as the weakest website that you use. This is why you don't reuse passwords, because um, you know, maybe you don't care if your Fitbit account gets hacked. What are they gonna steal, your steps? Great, add some more to my, to my count. <laughs> but if, if the password is the same and Fitbit wasn't very secure and you didn't care about it anyway because it's just Fitbit, but you use the same one on your bank or your student information system, now people have access to that, especially if you've paired up the same email address and password, now it's really, now you're really hit. Um, so using a diff, yes. Um, I have done that. As a matter of fact, I have the same password. So I have created so many passwords that I have forgotten. When they ask me, what's your Gmail? What is this? What is yes. it? Yes. I have a thousand passwords. It's very confusing. I mean, yes. it, it, what are you supposed to do? Just write down every single password? I have a solution for you, and I think you'll like it. Okay. Uh, so. Store your password securely in a password manager to avoid forgetting or slacking on the rules. Um, I use LastPass, that's mine. There's a lot of them out there. There's um, one password and there's, I think Dashlane is a password uh, manager. LastPass is the only one I've ever, I've ever needed. Uh, it is, it, it's nice, I really like it. Um, it stores your passwords, you, you create one password that is very secure. Uh, that's why it's called last pass. It's the last password you're ever gonna need to remember. Now mine is about this long. It's a sentence that I remember. And then I have added some personal touches to it, little changes in the characters, added a personal number that no one else would know. And this password then logs me into my last pass, which then has all of my other passwords stored on it. Now, not only that, it also generates passwords for me. So now I don't have to think up a new password every single time. I just say generate password. It creates some, some completely unintelligible gobbledygook that I don't understand. Uh, and so neither, <laughs> neither will someone else if they get, catch a glance. And um, then it stores it in there and associates it automatically to the website. So when I'm going on a website and I'm creating a new account, or I'm changing my password, uh, it says, hey, it looks like you're creating a new account. Do you want us to add this password? And I say, yes, please. Um, and if you hit the generate button, it automatically knows you're, you're creating a password. So again, it'll say, hey, do you want us to, to store this? And then it puts it in there. And you can, you can um, uh, also organize it with folders too. So you can say, hey, these are the ones for Google, or these are the ones for my, this classroom, or whatever you wanna say. You know, maybe these are all my English language arts type sites. These are all my math type sites. And then all of those are foldered. Now you don't really need to do that unless you have to go manually look at them, because when you go to the site, it also automatically fills in your password. So it really simplifies your password uh, creation, remembering, storage, recall, all of that. It fills it all in. Um, so, yeah, LastPass is the one I use. There's other ones out there. You know, you can look into them. But 
I really enjoy using it. It has simplified my life. I create a new LastPass account. Uh, it is free. Um, you can pay for a higher tier, which allows you to do things like sharing passwords between other accounts. Um, you can um, uh, you can have it on multiple devices if you have the premium version. So I have it on my computer, on my browsers, I have it on my phone. Uh, I can pull it up either place. Um, and it allows for um, a few other nice features, but you don't need it. It's free, so you can just create a free account. It'll store your passwords in there. I highly recommend that you write down, and this is, this is it's kind of, we've kind of come back around. It used to be, don't write down your passwords, that's dangerous. I write down my password and then I store it in my safe at home. Because if I ever forget it, at least I know that you know, 20 minutes away in my safe, I can go and get it and, and pull it out. Now, I use the sentence that's easy for me to remember and after typing in about 300 times, I have it locked in um, over, over a period of time. Uh, but I, 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 yeah, definitely write it down because they don't, they are hack, won't say proof, but they are hack resistant because even if you go to them and say, hey, I want to reset my password, they're going to be like, hmm, I don't think so. Here's a, here's a hint at least that you put in and if you left the hint blank, you get an email with a blank email that says, here's your hint. And uh, they really don't have your password. They can't give it to you. Um, so they have gotten a little bit more where you can make settings to reset it easier, but for me, I just make sure I have the recovery code and I've written down the password somewhere and store that in a safe place. So that way you can keep all your password, yeah. Can you reset other passwords? So like if you sign up for the last pass and then go, you know what, my Google's the same as my Apple's the same as this, same as this. Can I go like say, hey, can you like reset all those and then I can go back and change them or? I, I haven't found it to where it does it automatically, okay. but it does actually have smart alerts on there. It'll say, hey, um, I've noticed that you've used this for 63 sites. Do you want to go and change those passwords? And so what you can do is from your vault, they call it, if you click on that site and you say launch, it'll take you to there. And I think they might even have like a, like a, quick, a quick link for some sites where like if it's like, hey, you need to change this password, it actually knows where to take you to change it. Um, I haven't done that yet personally, but I know the alerts come up and I know um, it has that ability, but you can just click on it, go to that site, click change password, and then when you're in that password thing, you hit the generate password, it's a little extension you install in your browser, it drops down, you say generate password, boom, fill in the, it'll fill in the, um, the password and the confirm password so you don't have to re you know, type it yourself, or you can copy it from the generator, and then once you hit change password, it will go to the, it'll go pop up again and it'll say, hey, do you, we noticed that you changed this, do you want to update this password, or is this a new account? Do you want to create another entry for this same site? Um, so um, yeah, so it, it's great for that as well, and it will help you identify passwords that not only have been repeated, but it will also help you identify ones that may have shown up in attacks, so say, hey, we notice this password and we just saw it in the hacker site. So you might want to look at that too. Um, so it's really, really good for that kind of thing. Um, it also keeps a history of all your past passwords. So if for some reason like, like man, I, I thought that I changed it. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you just saved it and it didn't actually change. You can go back and look at pe previous passwords and try to use one of those. So yeah, this is, you know, we're spending a lot of time on a password manager, but it's actually one of the things that saves me the most time. Uh, whenever I work with a school, I go ahead and I create them a LastPass account and use that LastPass account for all the work that I do. So for the admin accounts that I set up for GoGuardian or Google Workspace uh, or, you know, any of the other sites, that all gets saved in there. Then when I'm done and it's, it's their, their, you know, their baby again, I just, here you go, here's the account, here's the password, it's all yours, it's linked to a school account, not my account. So now they have access to all those passwords and they're not left with a piece of paper that I printed out that says, you know, here's your password and they have to type them in. It's also very secure, yeah. What is the name of that the site that you're saying, the it, password manager? It is LastPass. LastPass? Yes, L-A-S-T-P-A-S, -S. yep, LastPass.com. LastPass.com. Yep, that's the, that's the website you go to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's if, you, if you take nothing else from this presentation, take LastPass with you, because it is, it is gold. Um, MFA, enable MFA on all possible accounts. This is becoming required. Um, the NAD is starting to require uh, 
MFA on all of their accounts and they're trickling it down to the unions and the conferences saying you need to use MFA to be secure. Um, cyber security insurance requires MFA on your, on your accounts. If you don't have that and you get hacked, uh, then they say, yep, sorry, you weren't being secure enough, that's on you, even though you've been paying the premiums, we're not gonna help you. Uh, what's that? Uh, Multi-factor authentication. So you've probably experienced this if you have any accounts where you sign in, you type in your password, that's one factor, authentication, and then you get a text message. That's a second factor of authentication. Um, so for all the accounts that you can, enable that. That will help to keep you secure. Uh, the Best, the, the best MFA is authenticator, at, well, <laughs> it's not the best. It's better than text messages. The best one is if you go like government level and they give you like a little key fob that has a randomly generated number and it's linked, you know, that's, that, that's, that's beyond what we need to do. But if you wanna be a little extra secure, if you're actually thinking that, you're, that you might be in, in the line of attack, and we all are, we say it's not if we get hacked, it's when. And we just try to prevent that for as long as possible and have as good of a recovery plan as we can when it does happen. So backing up all of our files, um, you know, making sure we have cyber insurance, um, making sure that you know, as much data as we can is, in, is encrypted and in different places. Uh, but it, it is gonna happen eventually. And so we accept that, but we try to mitigate the risks as much as possible. And authenticator apps, the reason that they are better than texts is that they, um, your text messages can actually be spoofed or intercepted. So if somebody really wants to get at you, they can, they can do what's called spoofing and they can actually get your phone number and get text messages that are sent to it. Or sometimes they, can, um, they may not be able to hack your account, but they might be able to hack the, the phone number that's going to it, somehow change that and so redirect the, the messages. So at least, at least with an uh, authenticator app, what that does is, um, you may have seen it, they, they scan, uh, actually I can show you one here. They scan, um, a QR code and that links your authenticator app with your account and they have the same randomly cycling series of numbers and they'll always match up from what's on your app to what the website is, is uh, requiring. So instead of a text message being sent to you, your app has it. So let me see if I can pull up my um, authenticator here and I should be able to show you. If I screen mirror, can I do it? Yes, I can, perfect. Well, we'll see how good the network is. Looks like it's not gonna let me do it. But uh, on here is a list of all of my sites that I have uh, covered in MFA and they cycle every 30 seconds. So right now I have a bunch of six digit numbers that in um, four seconds from now will all change and those will be synced up with another set later. Yeah, it's 30 seconds later uh, is what it does. But yeah, so I pull that up and I can, I can hit the button and it copies the code for me and I can paste it into the site or I can just look at it and type it into my computer while that, while that uh, prompt is up. So um, I believe and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but Beasley is the insurance company used by our NID entities for all of them. It's uh, risk, Adams Risk Management works with them, right? Um, I know the Con Michigan Conference uses it, so that's, and I assumed everybody did. Um, so conferences are required to meet the requirements for their coverage. There's a, um, a form that we have to fill out every year, and it's, I don't know how many sheets long. Uh, my director has to, has to do the paperwork, but it's got all of these things. Um, do you have redundant backups? Do you have multi-factor authentication enabled for your users? Do you have um, a firewall in place? You know, what, what are these things? And so we have to go through all of these things and check yes or no to them. And based on our answers, we either get a um, higher or lower premium, or they say, no, we're not gonna cover you at all. So we try to meet the requirements as closely as possible, possible because it makes the, our, our uh, premium a lot lower and our coverage a lot better. Um, so this year, uh, it's been going around the, um, the NAD forums about for IT 
talking about, well, hey, this we noticed in our in our Beasley insurance, and they this is something new that it says, uh, and your I can't remember the the, the phrasing now, but your um, basically your your entities that are underneath you, your sub-entities. And we were like, uh, what do they mean by sub-entities? I mean, like, obviously with the NAD, the sub-entities are the unions, and the unions, the sub-entities are the conferences, but how far does this go? Are schools considered sub-entities underneath each conference? And so this is something that's a little bit up in the air. Um, it kind of depends on what your school does. And so what we, what, you know, we kind of talked about it back and forth, and the conclusion was talk to your conference and talk to Beasley. Uh, essentially, if you think that your school might fall under this, um, th these requirements, fill out the paperwork, and Beasley will tell you whether or not you, you uh, need cyber insurance under them or if you fall under the conference. Yeah? Well, just to confirm what you're saying. Yeah. Last fall, Thunderbird Academy got hacked, uh, ransomware, and they wanted $130,000 to release the records, all the data, and we refused to pay it. It was cheaper, actually, to buy new servers <laughs> because there's no guarantee they're going to give it to you anyway. Right. This particular entity, the FBI, knew who they were and everything, so it was like $80,000 for new servers. Mm -hmm. But everybody lost everything, oh. everything. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much work that was lost, and they had to start all with new emails and the whole mm. nine yards. And actually, Beasley, they did not want to cover them. Um, they, um, so here was the situation. They didn't have cyber insurance, but they went, our lawyers said to go after the fact that we're under the conference. Yeah. But they um, did not agree with that because of the way it was worded in the, in the conference constitution or something. Oh, OK. And anyway, it, it was a battle for quite a while. They finally, finally ended up paying a little bit, but now they, they dropped us and they will not cover us anymore. Mm. Them, them, them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a, yeah. It's real. I mean, everything that you're saying, it's the real thing. Right. Yeah, we're, yeah, thank you for that. I didn't know specifically that. I knew Florida conference got hit um, pretty bad uh, a couple years ago. And um, they were able to negotiate with the ransomware, and they got it down from I think they wanted to four, like four million dollars originally, and they got it down to like two hundred and fifty thousand or something like that. Uh, but it was it was for an entity that did release it when you paid, so it was it was worth it for the data and uh, and all of that. Um, but yeah, all that to say, check with your conference, see if you're covered, because you know it, it depends on how your constitution is written for, for your conference. Um, but in general, I think what they're saying is have your schools fill out the paperwork, see if they, if they um, need cyber insurance to be covered under the conference or if they need cyber insurance themselves, because it can go either way. Um, I think some of the requirements were basically, uh, do you host any data on servers at your location? Um, do, you, you know, do you have any accounts that store this type of information? Uh, so it kind of depends on what your setup is at your school and what your relationship to the conference is as far as the, the constitution and stuff. So check that out and make sure what your situation is, because you don't you don't want to get hit with that. Um, it's it's getting worse. It's it's only getting worse. We've seen more and more cyber attacks because more and more people are going going digital, going on the cloud. Um, you know, being on the internet is not a bad thing. Um, neither is you know traveling on the road. But there are certain things that you have to do to mitigate the risks that go along with that convenience and that um, you know that additional benefit. So yeah, speak with your conference or your union to, to kind of clarify where you stand on that, and they'll you know they'll probably direct you to say hey fill out this fill out this form and, and see where you're at because if you don't have some of the things like you're not storing servers on your on your uh, premises and you're not doing this then you may qualify as a subordinate entity and as long as you're meeting the requirements like MFA and complex passwords and that type of thing then you're just you're going to be okay underneath the, the conference's coverage. But if you don't follow those, the conference may not want you to be considered under their coverage because like she said, now the, the um, conference that was uh, with the Thunderbird Academy, now Beasley doesn't even want to work with them at all. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky landscape to navigate.
All right, moving on. Um, ed tech in the classroom. So you have your internet router, you have your, or your modem, your router, you have your uh, firewalls and your filters all in place. You have the security that you need. Now you can do some fun things with it. Um, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. Uh, the, the reverse can be true and that you, you may want to um, use the same tool on everything. Um, uh, or sorry, this is the same tool on everything. You may want to use, <laughs> now, now I forgot, what was it? The, well, anyway, there's a lot of tools out there. And finding the right tool for the right job is important. Um, sometimes a tool, like a hammer, can be used for multiple things. Uh, you can you know, hit stuff with it. You can pry stuff with it. You can remove nails as well as, as hammer them in. Um, you can use it as a paperweight. You know, uh, that's, that's probably not a good application, but it does have multiple purposes. A Swiss Army knife is a better example where there's lots of tools built into one thing. So identifying the right tools for the right job and whether or not a multi-tool, so to speak, is appropriate and helpful uh, is important. Um, so. One such multi-tool would be uh, Google, their suite of, of tools. Um, so Google Workspace is uh, one of the platforms that we use uh, in schools. There's also Apple for education. There's Microsoft Teams for education. Um, personally, I use Google Workspace. They're, they're just farther ahead in the ed tech space uh, right now. However, that doesn't mean any of the others are uh, you know, not to be used. This is just the one that I found is the most useful. Um, so getting started with Google. Uh, if you would like your school to become Google, how many of you are already Google schools? So just a, just a handful. Okay, how many of you want to become Google schools that aren't already? Okay, got a couple, maybe you don't know. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's other options, like I said. How many of you are in Microsoft Teams? Anybody? All right, awesome. How many of you in, are in Apple schools? Apple for education, no? Okay, nobody in Apple, okay. How many of you don't really have a platform that you use, you just have computers that are sitting in the school? All right, yeah. So there's, there's some hands missing, I mean, maybe, maybe, Okay. All right. How many of you don't know what your school has? Okay. There. You go. That's the other one. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, the unknown. Okay. So um, if you're looking to get started, this is the, these are some of the steps to get started for Google. Uh, if it's another one, I actually don't know. I haven't I haven't done the other ones. Uh, you know, kind of kind of got hooked onto Google early on because they were the only one that, ones that were really doing anything. And now Apple and Microsoft are kind of trying to catch up with them. They're, they're trying to add some of the same features that Google already has. Um, it may be that one, at one point they surpass. Right now this is the one that I, that I recommend the most, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's the only one or the best one. It just means it's the one that I, that I think is the best. Um, so first thing that you have to do is you have to get a school domain. This is not your Adventist Church Connect website that you um, get for free with your school. Um, the, the NAD provides through Adventist School Connect, or Adventist Church Connect, Adventist School Connect. Um, that is their domain, because technically the domain is AdventistSchoolConnect.org or .com. I can't remember, now. I think it's .org. Um, but your, and your school just owns a small part of that, which is you know, your school's name and, and, and ID number, dot. Adventist School Connect. So that won't work with Google because technically then only one school would be able to do that and they would be at AdventistSchoolConnect.com. So for, um, well, I'll take, I, I worked at Lansing, uh, at Greater Lansing Adventist School, so theirs was GlassSchool.com. That was their school domain. And they also, we also had a Google, um, it used to be called G Suite for Education, then it became Google Workspace for Education. So that was their, their domain that they had. So once they owned the domain, which also allowed them to have a website, and you can connect 
your domain name. I don't know if you know this, but you can connect that domain name to your Abdis School Connect website, and it makes your website look a lot more um, official and professional. Because instead of them typing in um, Lansing3792, dot abdisschoolconnect.org. Now they type in glassschool.com and it takes them to the same website, but it looks, it looks official. It has your school's website address. You can put that on a pencil. It's a lot harder to put on Lansing3792. Dot. It, it doesn't look as good. Um, so I recommend it anyway. Talk to your conference, because some conferences will purchase domains. Michigan Conference, if you're in Michigan Conference, will purchase your school's domain for you and connect it, help you connect it to your um, Adventist School Connect website. Uh, and then we pay the renewal fee every year. The reason that we do this is because it, stop, it prevents one person from owning the domain, and then let's say that person leaves, goes to another conference, or you know, whatever happens, now the school doesn't own that domain anymore, and they don't have access to it unless that person, out of the kindness of their heart, volunteers to transfer it to the next person and the next person. You have this whole chain of transfers when you don't really need to use it that much, and if, so if your conference's IT department already does it, they'll manage it all and they'll point it wherever you want and, and, and then you don't have to worry about it. And then they pay the you know, $20, $30 a year to renew it too, which is, which is nice. It's not much, but it's nice. Um, so you have to contact the Google Education team. Uh, on, on, you, can just, uh, you can just search for um, you know, Google for Education, sign up, and it'll pull up uh, where you need to go. Um, Contact them and don't take no for an answer. I have set up multiple schools with uh, Google Workspace for education and our schools have a very hard time getting Google sometimes. Um, we don't exist in some of the public school registries. Um, we don't necessarily look like we're our own nonprofit organization because we're under the conference, which is under the union, which is under the NAD, which is under the GC, and we all share the same uh, 501c3. So they don't always recognize us as a um, school, let alone a nonprofit school. They'll say, "Oh, well, you take tuition, so so you're not a, you're not a nonprofit organization." Well, no, we take tuition as part, but it's not. <laughs> it doesn't cover even part of it, even <laughs> a fraction. So um, they don't get that sometimes, and I've had to go back and forth with them. Uh, it also depends on how long your school's been around. The you know the number the. You know, some, some schools, it's like, oh yeah, you're good, you're in, here's your account, you're done. Other schools, it's like, sorry, we don't see that you exist. Um, having a school domain that's connected to a school website is a very good place to start. If, they, if you don't even have a school website, they won't, they won't even start the process. They're like, well, you don't even exist. If you don't have a website, you don't exist. Um, so that's, that's the start, is you have to work with them, you go back and forth, give them whatever forms they need, uh, and then, after that, if you are doing um, Chromebooks or if you want to upgrade your level of licensing, some of the features uh, that you get with Google Workspace for Education Plus when you, when you uh, pay to go a little bit higher on the tier, you get to you get unlimited recording of uh, Google Meet meetings. Um, you get uh, plagiarism checks in Google Classroom, so papers and things that are that are submitted. It will um, verify those against Google searches or Wikipedia. Make sure large part portions aren't copied and pasted. Uh, it will even search any papers that have been submitted in the past in your school and other schools. And so it'll say, "Oh, that's interesting. You had a sibling that took the same class three years ago, and they wrote exactly the same paper." Uh, and all you had to do was change the first name because it's your sibling. Uh, so it, it will check those things and come back with, you know, hey, this is 87% this is, this is original or this is 5% original. And so then you can do those kind of checks. So that's a premium feature. There's other, there's other things, but um, those are just some of the highlights. Yeah. Good question. I might not have to do that, but uh, I worked at a different school last year, and I did some work on Google Slides. Yeah. And I, I forgot to use my flash drive to, right? So I wanted to know if there's any way that I can, even though I'm not in that school anymore, still get that information that I created. You know, it's just if, if they haven't deleted your account yet, uh, and do you still have, have you tried logging into the account? Logging in. Okay, so if they have deleted your account and a certain period of time has gone by, it would have removed all of those files. Um, but if 
uh, they didn't delete it, let's say they just suspended the account, they could re-enable the account and allow you to log in. And there's something called Takeout, Google Takeout, which you can use to transfer all of your files and everything from one Google account to another. So it's just takeout.google.com. And you take, you know, so it's great if you're transferring schools. Uh, if you don't know where you're going yet, you can actually just create a Gmail. I created one, it was called um, glassschooldump at gmail.com. Like I'm, I'm dumping all my files from here over into this account and then I can sort through them later because I don't have a whole lot of time. I just did the Google takeout and all of the files and emails and everything just dumped over into that, that account. And then if I needed to later, I can pull, pull it from that one into my new school account. Um, it's called Google? Takeout, yeah. Google takeout.com? Uh, takeout.google.com. Yeah, Google, Google likes to do the, the, it's called a subdomain. And so they do a, a, a word and then dot and then google.com. So docs.google.com, slides.google.com. And in this case, takeout.google.com. Takeout.google.com. Correct, yep, that's it. And so you can move all your stuff from one account to the other and it just copies it over and then you can say, okay, now you can delete my account. Well, because one time I worked at the school and then I, I left for a year or two years and when I went back and I went back into the account, my things were still there. So yeah. I was wondering if I can still do that without having to, you know, be in the school system yeah. and still take out my stuff. Yeah, as long as your account still exists, so you'd have to contact the, the, the school and say, hey, is my stuff still here? And if it's not, then, then, then there's nothing that can really be done there. So it would be at the uh, contact IT or HR? I, who, I don't know who would ru be running it. Uh, you know, you could start with HR because, you know, they'd be able to tell you a little bit, but IT would probably be the one that that handles it. Um, yeah, so it, it just depends on how long they retain accounts and whether or not they delete them or suspend them. Um, if they delete them, then I think you have like 60 or 90 days before the account just is gone forever and can't be recovered. Um, yeah, so that's another thing to keep in mind when you're managing student and teacher accounts. Think about your policies, like do we delete accounts when students leave or do we move them into a graduated uh, you know, group. Um, you know, because so, we've had some students where they're like, hey, I need my account because I'm using it for college applications. Can I still keep the email address for now? Um, so, you know, we, you know, we have to decide, is that something that you do or is it that you don't do? How soon do you delete or do you just suspend? Um, something that kind of dictates that is if you're doing not just the free version of Google Education and you're doing one of the paid versions, a suspended account counts as a licensed user, so you're paying for that user. Um, I don't know if they've changed it since. Uh, it used to be that the uh, licensing structure for Google was you buy one teacher license and you get 10 student licenses for free. So for every one teacher, 10 licenses. Um, so if you have you know, two teacher accounts and, and five students, well, you got 15 extra accounts, so it doesn't really matter if you leave their accounts active for a little while afterwards. But eventually, you know, if you're always gonna only have two teachers, you know, sure, maybe those five students move all the way through and they graduate, you have five more students. Well, after four years or five, year, you know, five years, you've filled up your 20 licenses and now you don't have anything left, so now you need to decide where, you know, where do you kind of draw the line. Um, but and those are just kind of things to, to discuss with the people that are helping you set it up and you know what your policies are and it depends on school board, administration, whoever, whatever level you wanna set those policies at. Yeah, so um, you can get licensed through a vendor. Uh, there's a lot of good vendors out there. Um, when we buy, if you're looking to purchase Chromebooks, we buy um, through Trafera. Uh, it used to be called Trinity 3, and then they merged with another company, Firefly Technologies, and so now it's called Trafera. And they sell, I think mostly Chromebook, they have all sorts of educational things, they sell smart screens and all this stuff. Um, but one thing that ha when you buy through them, they will um, purchase the license for your device as well that you need to manage them and then they will do what's called white glove service for free. It, it's built into the cost of the, the device, but they'll add the devices to your Google Workspace account, license it, connect it all up, and now you're good to go. And then they provide a four year warranty that covers accidental damage and anything that happens to it, and you just 
contact them, say, hey, this serial number has a cracked screen. They'll say, great, here's a shipping label. Send that to us. A couple days later, you get it back completely repaired. Um, so the turnaround is really nice. The service is really nice. Um, I've, I've used them for most of my Chromebook purchases, except uh, during the, you know, the middle of the pandemic when there was nothing available, I had to purchase some off of Amazon and license those myself. So, um, yeah. Now, is that for only for schools, or is that, will they do personal? They'll sell, they, I mean, yeah, I'm sure they'll sell you anything, yeah. Uh, as far as the, as far as the license. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I don't know. You'd have to talk to them. I've done really small orders with them, though. I've done five or 10 devices for a school, um, and I've done 50 or 100 devices for a school. So I don't know if they do one, maybe. Um, you could ask them. It, it, it wouldn't hurt. Um, but the, at least when you're buying for a school, uh, you know, it's a nice way to get started, and you don't have to worry about doing it yourself. Um, What's that? T-R-A-F-E-R-A -E dot com. And I, I talked with uh, Jonathan Warre. Uh, he's, the, he's the vendor for our area, I believe. Let's see. I have some of their contact information in the slides, and I can provide some of that for you. Um, I was going to make this available so that you can click some of these here. Um, this, like for instance, this Think Ahead is actually a uh, link to a YouTube video that talks about planning out how you're gonna organize your students' accounts and your teacher accounts. Um, so uh, you get something called OUs or organizational units and it's basically people folders. And so all your staff go into one folder and then you can set rules and restrictions for that one folder. Then your students can all be in one folder and then underneath that can be folders of first through fourth grade, fifth through sixth grade, you know, depending on your grade bands. And you can set different rules and restrictions for each of those individually as well. Um, so uh, another good vendor, if you're looking for one, is Amplified IT. They're a Google partner. They can sell you the licenses um, for Google Workspace. They can, if you just purchase some Chromebooks from Best Buy or Amazon or whatever, and you just have a single device that you need to register or 20 devices you need to register, they can also sell you the management licenses. That allows you to take those devices and lock them down as school devices and not just a home device. Um, so then, then it's, it's manageable through your Google Workspace account. Uh, so yeah, we talked a little bit about organizing, um, you know, your people, your people folders. Does it make sense? Um, you know, naming schemes. Uh, what I like to do is I like to do first name and last initial for students, and then I do first initial and last name for teachers. And so you have, you know, your 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 more student sounding email addresses for students, and then you have your more professional sounding email addresses for uh, the teachers. Um, if you're looking at Chromebooks, uh, make sure it meets your needs. Do you need a touch screen? So look in, look in that line. Uh, are you gonna need to uh, plug in you know, USB thing? Make sure it has the right amount of ports, headphone jacks. Uh, most of them have it because they're built for students. Uh-oh, lost our connection here. <laughs> oh, has it been gone? Oh, no. All right, what did we miss here? Yeah, here we are. All right. Um, make sure the Chromebooks meet your needs. Make sure that they're going to have longevity. Um, you know, the, the four-year warranty is nice, but uh, Chromebooks last. If you purchase them, um, make sure that uh, they can have up to seven years from the time that their chip is manufactured before they reach the end of life. If you look up um, Google's auto update policy, and I think it actually might be, yeah, it's this one. Uh, their auto update expiration policy, you can look up every Chromebook manufacturer out there, HP, Lenovo, Samsung, Asus, Acer, it's all there. And then you can look at the different models. It'll tell you when it will stop getting updates. So, I mean, this isn't anything new for technology. Um, Windows devices, we've been running out of, you know, XP. That's actually how I got my school to upgrade to uh, Chromebooks. 
the, the computer lab was on Windows XP, and uh, finally they were, they were, it was like, hey, look, we're not gonna support this anymore, it's not gonna be secure, you're not gonna get any more updates, um, and the computer hardware was too old for us to put on anything newer than, than, than Windows XP. So instead of upgrading the computers, because I mean, they were like four years old when Meyer donated it to us six years prior to that. So they were really old computers. So we upgraded to Chromebooks, and the Chromebooks, you know, they had five to seven years left on them when, by the time we bought them. And so computers in technology world, we talk about, you know, usually about five years is the life cycle, but Chromebooks can do up to seven based on the guaranteed auto updates. That may change in the future. They talked about it, um, making it so that you can at least have security updates. You won't get the new fancy features, but your Chromebooks will continue to be secure. Not something that they've done yet, but they've talked about it, but your devices are gonna have about the same longevity as any other device. Um, you just have to make sure that you're looking at, and, and it's nice because Google is at least more upfront about it. With a PC, they don't have an auto expiration. It's like, well, it has this much RAM, this much uh, you know, hard drive, and it has this much, uh, you know, this powerful CPU, and there you go, and you have it. And it's like, great, how long is that gonna last me? Well, we don't know. It kind of depends on what Windows and Microsoft does, and you know, but generally, around five years. So at least with this, you can actually go look on a list and say how many years is left on this. Sometimes those sales that you see in Meijer or Walmart or Costco, those computers have like three, those Chromebooks have like three years left on them. That's why they're selling them for so cheap is they're getting to the end of their life. So whenever I see those, I pull up the list and I look at that model and I'm like, oh, yep, that's why. If it has five to seven years on it, then I go, oh, this is a good deal. Or, well, what's the specs? Maybe it's not a, you know, a good one to start out with. So you have to do that shopping. Make sure that it meets your longevity. If you can get a warranty on it, that's great in a classroom. Um, Another part of longevity is durability. Like the ones that I get are the Lenovo 500E. The E is for education, so they're built rugged. They have a drain underneath the keyboard, so if you spill some liquid in it, it will actually drain out of the keyboard instead of being stuck in there. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Um, they have rubber bumpers around the edges that are added because they know kids are gonna uh, drop them. So something like that, look at the durability. If it, if it feels fragile and flimsy, it probably is. Um, um, and then a warranty, you know, uh, even if you buy them off of Amazon, um, like I said, I had to buy some off of Amazon and I purchased their little third party warranty that they have. I think it was a Shurion. Um, they also sell ones from like State Farm. I'm like, oh really, you're gonna <laughs> cover my car and my house and my Chromebook. Um, but we used them, we, we had a couple that were broken, we sent them in and they repaired it. So that was a good investment for us on there. Um, I think it costs like, I don't know, $50 per device, and it's protecting a three or $400 device. So that's a good, it's a good turnaround if, you know, if it's gonna be broken. Oh, let's see. Um, student assignments, uh, you can use Google Classroom. For assignments, uh, they have integrations with other uh, apps and things. Um, you can use them for rostering and signing into other things. So, you know, if you have a Google Classroom and you have them on something like um, readworks.org is one that I use, uh, you can actually import your classroom into there and assign, do assignments based on your Google Classroom. So you're setting up your groups in one place. Um, Cami is a great place to uh, get assignments in. This is one that takes um, your paper assignments, your PDFs or whatever, you can put them in there and they become fillable on the student's devices. Um, and then it's not just like a, well, fill this PDF out, make sure that you save your changes, then email it back to me or attach it. You actually give them a link for the assignment they pull up the PDF and then when they fill it in and they hit return, it goes back to the teacher. And this integrates with Google Classroom or it can be standalone as well. So it, it works really nicely. They can have fill in the blanks with text. They can also just write right on the, right on the PDF depending on how you set it up. Um, yeah, so custom assignment formats, you can digitize your worksheets. They can submit handwritten or paperwork uh, by scanning it into the app. Um, Blooms.net is another one. Uh, it's not a very it's not a very popular one. I used it mostly for the classroom management behavior tracking um, features of it, but you can accept assignments through there. You can create a student portfolio of work, um, and there's other there's other features there. Uh, Classroom management, and I'm just going through these real quick because uh, we're running out of time, uh, but there will be time for questions afterward. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, Blooms on that has assignment portfolio. 
And then for classroom management, uh, I used blooms.net. That one was a, a great site for um, behavior tracking. So uh, it has an assignments portfolio, but it also had a classroom economy type tracking. So as the students would do things that were, that were good or if they got points off, it would track their, their points on this site. And it would actually, you know, it's blooms for blooms taxonomy, but it's actually, uh, it would also have a little flower pot. And as they, as they got closer and closer to their point goal, their little flower would grow. And then when they, it bloomed, it created a sound. And I had a whole screen set up just to, just to show that at all times so the kids could always see where their progress was. And uh, then, you know, so they loved that. And then every time it bloomed, we'd have like a little celebration. And then the kids would get a prize and they'd come up and, oh, it's, oh he bloomed, he bloomed. You know, the kids knew where they were even when the screen wasn't up. They, they like, they had it tracked and like, oh, oh, Rachel's about to, Rachel's about to bloom. We're like, how do you know that? I don't even know that. Like, <laughs> I have to look at it. I'm like, sure enough, you're right. Yeah. So they, they would be, they would be really on top of that. Um, it also does parent communication. You can set it up so that the parents get notified of good and bad events. Um, you can also just communicate with them directly. You can do sign up sheets for events, ask for volunteers. It has a lot of great communication uh, aspects to it. So that's one uh, nice tool for the classroom. What's that? Is it free? It should be free, yes. Uh, it was free when I used it. A lot of things are getting to subscription, but I believe it is still free, yes. It sounds like Class Dojo. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, Class Dojo is another, yeah, exactly. It's kind of the same thing. So it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. So if Class Dojo works better for you, great. Yeah, that's, that's good. But these are just ones that you could check out if you're looking, you know, say, let's say Class Dojo isn't checking all your boxes. Mm -hmm. Check this out. Maybe it has some things that Class Dojo doesn't, or maybe Class Dojo is better, and you know, recommend it to all your friends. But yeah, um, I think you know, keeping a good network of educators is important because they, you know, we can't know all the things that are going on all the time, and. Uh, Especially, you know, with with ed tech, like like you mentioned, you have Class Dojo. It sounds like the same thing. Well, I don't know which one's better because I didn't have time to try, try out Class Dojo. I, I saw it and I actually wanted to, but I tried Blooms and it did all the things I needed it to do, and so I ran with that one. I never got around to Class Dojo, but someone else might have. And you know, we don't have the we don't have the time to try out five or six or seven different ones. So I like to listen to uh, ed tech podcasts. Um, you know, different, different ed tech bloggers, YouTubers, they're looking into these things on a regular basis and then I can use what they say to evaluate it and use your friends, you know, use your network of educators to say, hey, I am, I'm looking for this feature and I just haven't found it. Have you seen anything like that? So yeah, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a good one. So Class Dojo, sim similar kind of classroom economy. Um, if you really want a true economy, something like Bankaroo, uh, this actually lets you do a digital classroom economy. Um, you can do automatic weekly deposits into your students' bank accounts. They get like a like a, a fake bank login, um, and you can do automatic deposits. So let's say you wanted to do a, a salary, or you know you were doing desk rent and things like that. Uh, they can set savings goals for certain reward levels. Uh, they can set group goals. Um, they can also let's see. I think I have some in here. Uh, this was either from Bankaroo or from Kids Bank. There's, that's another one. And I actually pr uh, printed out some dollars. These are from Morrison Mutual. And it has a dollar amount on it, so they could you know, use this to, to spend in, in cash. Or there's a little code on it. Uh, you know, just random string of, of letters, but it was specific to this bill. So if they wanted, they could deposit it into their bank account digitally, and then, you know, this bill just goes in the garbage or, you know, goes back to a pile uh, uh, of bills. And so they could, it was kind of an extension of the paper bill system. Now you have a digital bank, too, so they can start learning about online banking and, and, and budgeting using some digital tools. Um, content enriching, uh, enrichment, content area enrichment. Uh, so these are some of the tools I use. I mentioned readworks.org uh, when talking about Google Classroom. Um, this is a great resource for language arts. Uh, you have pre-sorted reading assignments. Um, Google Classroom integration. 
uh, comprehension and vocabulary. So you go with the pre-sorted reading assignments, you can go into all sorts of different categories. They have grade level, they have interest uh, uh, categories, they have lexile levels, um, pretty much all the, different, all the different ways that you might want to sort it. Um, they, have, they have it there. And so you can find passages for your students. They even have um, packages, like uh, this is a week of, of reading here, and they have like five or six different articles that all go together on the same theme or topic. And then they have comprehension and vocabulary questions built into them that you can choose whether or not you want to assign them. Um, and uh, then the students answer those and it actually sends that back to your Google Classroom graded. Um, so unless there's a you know open-ended you know question and then it says hey they got six out of ten on the multiple choice uh, and now you have to grade these three questions here and you go through and, and grade them. But yeah. it's free, all of these are free. Readworks.org is free for, for teachers, you yes. Bankaroo is free um, I think up to a certain level. I think if you have more than 50 students in a school then they require you to pay. Some of them are some of them are like there's a free level and then there's a paid level. The Bankaroo one, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like if you have more students than this, then yes, otherwise it's free. Um, for most of our small schools, it's never an issue. Uh, so, you know, we haven't had to worry about that. One of the benefits of, of small classroom size, um, but some of them, if they have a, most of, the, most of the resources I use are free or at least were the last time I checked on them. Um, Readworks.org I know is, is still free. Uh, that's provided through grants and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, they, so they automatically grade your assignments. Um, and actually I want to say a little bit more about ReadWorks. It also has differentiation built into the assignments. Um, so if you have students on different le reading levels, they can be reading the same article but it changes the, changes the level for them. So there's an A and a B level. Um, you can add helps where some students might actually get um, the ability to listen to the passage where others don't get that ability. Um, there's uh, ESL helps, or I think, I don't think we're calling it ESL anymore. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so you have different, gr different groups and, and, and categories where the assignments will match up to the students' reading group, but you can still have them on the same topic. Uh, Moby Max. This is this is a great one. This is overarching, comprehensive. covers covers a lot. Um, I used it a lot for math and grammar were my big ones for for um, stations. Um, it's standards based, so that's great. It's been standards based for years before that became a a, a thing. Um, it pretests for gaps. Their, their motto is filling in the gaps. So it will test your students as they're coming in, find out maybe, maybe they're in fourth grade, for instance, and they're really solid in third grade math, but for some reason there's a concept in second grade that they just didn't get. It'll identify that, and then it'll give them reinforcement on that topic and then work them through so that all their, so it'll say, oh, well, you're missing a little bit here in second grade standards. You're missing a little bit here in fourth grade standards. And it will work with them on that progressively until they've mastered it. And then it'll bring them up to grade level. And then it'll bring them beyond grade level. So I had some students who came in, they were in sixth grade, but they were missing some third, fourth, and fifth grade um, you know, standards. Uh, and so they, would, they did that. And then by the end of the year, they were working on eighth grade math concepts. So it continues on for them, and so you, it, it goes from being um, a review and, and uh, remediation to being enrichment. And so it's a great, it's a great one to do. I would do it parallel with my math, so because you know, you don't necessarily want to hold a student back just because they're missing a couple standards. So we would do the third grade work, and then they would be kind of filling in the gaps at the same time, so they could stay in their third grade class or whatever it was, do the do the work along with them and then it would help to fill those in on the side. Um, so yeah, pretest for the gaps. It gives you reports, which is great for parent-teacher parent conferences. I can say, hey, they came in, they were missing these standards. By this quarter, they got up to here. By this quarter, they filled this in. Uh, it, is, it is really great. So it's, it targets the missing standards, uh, <laughs> generates the parent reports. Uh, so those are, some, those are some great things that I used for, um, for stations. Uh, it does everything from number sense, math facts. You can do fact masters. 
teachers, and then it does actual like concept lessons. And you can go in and you can target if you even if they even if let's say that the, the assessment didn't pull out something, or you're doing a lesson and you want to enrich the lesson, you can actually assign to them specific standards and say, hey, we're working on um, area right now. So I want to get third grade or fourth grade area, and you click that, and then you assign it to those students, and you say, I want to move this to the top of their list. So instead of waiting for them to work through their gaps in second grade, which that was just you know division, you know uh, denominator, you know whatever, now. Um, now it will skip that for now, it'll put that to the side, help them with the area, because that's what you're working on in class, and then once they have mastered that part or, or you, you know, take that assignment away, then it'll go back to filling in the gaps that they were, that they were missing, so, yeah. Is this just for math? Is this just for math? math they, have, they have math, they have grammar, I had them, I had them doing grammar on it. Uh, it has science and social studies, it has reading passages. Okay. I, What's that? Vocab. Vocab, yep, yep. So, yeah. It, it, has, it has a very wide gamut. Do you teach other than Bible? Yep. I was, careful, I was careful with the reading and the science modules because obviously that's, you know, they had different modules on evolution and things like that. Um, and then the reading, uh, some of the passages that it, that it gave them access to, ghosts, Harry Potter, you know, different things like that, that, uh, you know, so I didn't always use that as much, but you could use some parts of it. Uh, maybe they've, they've enhanced it since then. Um, but the, um, there's other ones like uh, epic reading and things like that that I use for libraries. But. And, and is this free also? Uh, this one you do have to pay a subscription for. Um, I think it was like $99 for the year for the classroom last I checked. There's a link in the Adventist online tech store. We posted in Adventist. Awesome. And it's on there. It's one of the approved vendors or discounted vendors that they have. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think I saw, yeah, I did see that in there. So yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, what? No, Epic is, Epic is not, um, but Moby Max is. Epic is free for, for teachers. Mm -hmm. they char what they do is they charge the parents if they want to keep that. But all right, we are out of time. And um, if anybody wants to stick around for the session after this, I'll be doing more question and answer and we can do some workshop stuff. Thank you very much for your time.